Hello and welcome to Dialect. I'm Tony Gosling. Dialect is Bristol's first podcast, set up in 2002 and goes out every Thursday morning at 11am here on BCFM 93.2. This week, Churchill's Man of Mystery, Desmond Morton and the World of Intelligence, with the author, Jill Bennett. This is Churchill's personal assistant, a very secretive chap, in the run-up to World War II and right the way through the war. To start, Churchill's Man of Mystery and Jill Bennett, the author of the book, is joining me on the line now. Could you introduce yourself uh, and tell us why you chose Desmond Morton to write a book about? Okay, well, my name's Jill Bennett. I was the chief historian at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office between 1995 and 2005. And when I worked there, I kept coming across Desmond Morton in all sorts of different contexts. And I became very interested in him. And so I tried to investigate a little more. Uh, And I was lucky enough to be given permission to go through the secret archives in order to find out about him. Tell us about those secret archives. Well, um, as you know, the archives of the Secret Intelligence Service, otherwise known as MI6, are not open to the public and they are not released into the public domain. So the only way you can see them is if you are appointed as an official historian, which I was, and that meant I could have access to the records about Desmond Morton in the SIS archives. Now, tell us uh, uh, a little bit about uh, his his childhood and his early life. Well, he was, a, unfortunately, he is such a secret person that it's very difficult to find out about his personal life. But he was an only child, uh, late Victorian upbringing, went to Eton, then went to Woolwich to the Military Academy, and he just came out of that when the First World War started, and he went straight to the Western Front from Woolwich. Uh, so how did he get on there? Well, he had a very hard war. He was in the Royal Field Artillery. He commanded a battery of guns, and uh, they were the people who really were on the front line all the time. But in 1917, he suffered a severe wound. He was shot, and a bullet lodged near his heart, where it remained until he died at the age of 80. Uh, So he was invalided home, but then went back uh, in order to serve as the aide-de-camp to uh, Field Marshal Haig. Now, let's just uh, go back slightly. Uh, You're saying that you kept coming across him. Uh, what was it that piqued your interest then about, uh, about Desmond Morton? Because obviously, you know, as an archivist and a historian, you're going to come across lots of people to do with the Second World War. Why Desmond? Well, because he, he kept coming up in different contexts. Um, in the late 90s, I was involved in a big investigation uh, commissioned by the then Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, of the Zinoviev letter, which was a letter that had supposed to have been sent by the Comintern to the British Communist Party in 1924. And Morton's footprints were all over that story. Later on, I was working on those issues that used to be called Nazi gold, about the gold that was confiscated from governments and individuals during the Second World War. And I found that he was the British commissioner on the Tripartite Gold Commission, And he turned up in various other places. And I thought there must be something about him. And I got interested in him. I think you're absolutely right. There was, because between the wars, he met Winston Churchill, didn't he? Can you can you tell us um, how that happened and and what transpired? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. OK, that's OK. I know between the wars, uh, Desmond met Winston Churchill. How did he meet him? And what he actually met Churchill on the Western Front in the First World War, when Churchill briefly served out there in 1916. And the two of them met um, on the battlefield at a place called Plugstedt, and they became friends. And they uh, remained friends and saw one another occasionally. 
uh, in the 20s, Morton bought a house in Kent near Chartwell, where Churchill's house was. And uh, because they were both interested in, in armament, British rearmament and uh, British economic preparations for war, they spent a lot of time together. Consequently, uh, later on, when Churchill became prime minister in May 1940, he asked Morton to become his intelligence advisor, and Morton went to work with him in number 10. Well, that's interesting that they lived close to each other near Chartwell in Kent. I mean, it makes you wonder whether uh, there were clandestine meetings down there that maybe Churchill walked the mile or so, mile and a half over to Seamort and and the other way round. I think it's more likely to be the other way round. Churchill was not a great one for walking. Um, We know that Morton used to walk over the hill. In fact, I've I've, I've travelled that route when I was doing the book. It's not very far. Uh, There are a lot of stories about how Morton supplied secret information to Churchill, but I really um, don't think that this is true. Government ministers themselves supplied Churchill with information, even when he was not in the government. Uh, Churchill, after all, had been um, a cabinet minister on a number of occasions. He was very well uh, plugged in to the political establishment. In fact, Churchill himself, had a very wide set of intelligence connections where he collected intelligence and quite a lot of it he passed on to Morton. So I'm afraid that the nice story about Morton passing him secret information uh, around the back door is not a true one. But on the other hand, both of them had access to uh, secret reports on, for example, German rearmament. Well, that's right, because in the interwar years, Churchill wrote a very influential book, didn't he, called The Gathering Storm? Yeah, well, of course, he wrote it later. Um, but, I mean, it, Churchill, of course, is, is known for having uh, attacked the government during the 1930s, um, urging it to rearm more quickly. But you have to remember that it's all very well for people who are in opposition uh, to say that such and such a thing should happen and that money should be spent in a certain way. Churchill um, believed it was his duty to ginger up the government and try and make them rearm more quickly. But he was also well aware of the constraints that government ministers have in that regard. So Churchill could undoubtedly cause quite a lot of trouble for the government, but they all knew him well. uh, And um, it, it was by no means quite so cut and dried as a lot of books make out. So what was Morton's job at MI6? Morton, after the First World War, after, in 1919, he left Hague and he went to work in uh, what it was then called Section MI1C, but it was the Secret Intelligence Service. And he had a job called Head of Production, which meant essentially he was responsible for getting hold of information, overseas intelligence, particularly on Soviet Russia, and, uh, and you know, uh, finding out, all, who, you know, having officers posted all over different territories who were passing about information which he collated uh, and passed on to whoever needed to see them. So it was a very central position. Uh, and what about into the Second World War? Um, because obviously Churchill had been quite sidelined in the run-up to World War Two. but as soon as it became clear that Nazi Germany was uh, on, on a campaign to take over countries, Churchill's star rose very rapidly. What, what was Morton yes, doing at this time? It did. I mean, after Chamberlain became Prime Minister in 1937, I mean, by that time things were were definitely, uh, you know, getting very difficult and everybody was aware that there was likely to be a war. Um, But Churchill was by no means popular in the Conservative Party, so it it took a long time before anybody was willing to embrace the idea of having him in the government. But then um, after uh, the first nine months of the war and then there was the attack on the Low Countries, basically um, uh, Chamberlain went, as you know, Chamberlain stepped down, and uh, Churchill became prime minister, and really he came into his own then. He was a man who flourished in wartime. What do we know about uh, Desmond Morton's other associates at the time, particularly during uh, and at the beginning of the Second World War? Well, I mean, he was the prime minister's eyes and ears in liaison with the um, intelligence agencies initially in the Second World War. Later on, 
Churchill um, formed his own closer relationships with the heads of the various agencies, and Morton didn't have quite so much to do. But certainly in 1940 and, and for a couple of years thereafter, Morton spent his time on Churchill's behalf gathering information um, and telling the intelligence agencies what Churchill wanted and basically putting a, putting a bomb under them, not literally, of course, whenever he felt it was necessary. It was a kind of position of power that Morton very much enjoyed, but it wasn't, it wasn't a proper job, if you like. He was an advisor. He didn't have, uh, you know, he didn't have a, a, a ministry or civil service job. Uh, what about his personal private life? Did he ever get married, have children? No, he never married, and I never found any, uh, any reference to him having any close relationship with either man or woman. He, he was one, though. I mean, there were quite a lot of men like Morton who had, had, had been in the First World War and had a, you know, a really very bad experience, which marked them forever. And there, there was a whole generation in some ways of um if you like rather rather careful bachelors who who enjoyed um uh, mixing with their fellow men but they didn't they didn't marry and they didn't form close relationships and i do think that the first world war had a lot to do with that i never found anything more about his private life now, you mentioned that he was looking into Soviet Russia. I mean, of course, during World War II, um, we were allies uh, with Soviet Russia. Uh, what, right. was, what was Morton's approach to that? Because he seemed to have spent quite a lot of his time, um, really, I suppose, uh, seeing them as the enemy. Well, that's right. And, of course, he wasn't the only one. I mean, it was uh, the alliance with the Soviet Union was, of course, a matter of high politics and a matter of strategy. Uh, and uh, Britain was no, I mean, not always good bedfellows with the Soviet Union. However, Morton, um, like any government servant, did what he had to do. But it's clear from letters he wrote later that he found aspects of the Soviet regime very distasteful. Morton was a very religious man. He was a devout Roman Catholic. And, of course, um, a Soviet com communism was um, definitely an atheistic doctrine, which he didn't approve of, quite apart from anything else. What happened uh, at the end of the war then? Did Morton still retain some of his anti-Soviet uh, capabilities? Because many people, of course, yes, did. I think he did, though uh, I wouldn't, uh, it didn't really apply to his professional life. After the Second World War ended, he did several jobs. He sat on the um, reparations commission as the... British uh, Reparations Commission, that was to do with uh, getting uh, countries recovering war from Nazi Germany and so on. Um, uh, he didn't really have to have an awful lot to do with the Soviet Union, but letters that he wrote shows that he, he had no illusions about the way the Soviet Union was going. Now, I was uh, at Chartwell um, this summer um, and walking through uh, Churchill's study down near, near Westrum in Kent yes. and uh, spoke to one of the, the guides for the National Trust down there uh, and asked them about um, Churchill and his Freemasonry. And he was I was immediately denied. He said, no, Churchill was never a Freemason. And I said to the guide, um, wasn't Churchill a Freemason? He said, no, he was never a Freemason. Well, of course, then I brought up on my smartphone uh, a Daily Mail article which explained that uh, Churchill's Masonic um, desk uh, equipment, uh, bits and pieces, were being sold at auction. So, of course, he was a Freemason. Um, and many people point to this as a sort of negative influence because the Yalta Agreement, all three of them were Freemasons, him and Roosevelt and Stalin, for example. Winston Churchill's um, writing case, Masonic writing case, with his um, Masonic equipment in it, um, in including a portable leather satchel um, and various other things, was sold at auction uh, in May 2008. Uh, there is evidence that, uh, you know, if you want it there, that, that Churchill was a Freemason. Uh, what about Morton? Well, I mean, I know what's said about Churchill, and I mean, obviously, if there was some equipment, there's some equipment. But from all the documentation that I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot, I've never seen any evidence that Churchill, Churchill actually was a Freemason, nor do I believe that Morton was, although during the 1920s, when he was involved with um, various circles of British businessmen that he was trying to get information out of. He, if you like, uh, played the role of a Mason in order to get information from them. 
If they were Masons, they, it was extremely secret because I've never seen anything to indicate that. Uh, what about uh, this business with the uh, the Nazi Gold Commission? Because this was obviously a very important job Morton had right at the end of the war. Yes. Well, I mean, what happened was at the end of the war, um, a tripartite gold commission that was Americans, the French and the British was set up in order initially it was to try and get back some of the gold because countries like Belgium, the whole of their central bank had been taken over by the Nazis and they lost everything. So it was trying to find and retrieve some of the gold that belonged to these countries and give it back so that they could um, try to get back some sort of economic life after the war. There was obviously there was also a question of of gold that had been taken from individuals and property that had been either hidden or destroyed or indeed had been laundered by supposedly neutral countries during the war. Now, um, although quite a lot was known about this, it only, the whole truth really only started to come out in the late 1990s when there was a, a lot of uh, stories that came out about dormant bank accounts in Swiss banks and so on in which some of this property was hidden. But in the 40s, um, the commission had just started work, and Morton was the British commissioner for a while. In fact, it was quite a bureaucratic job, um, and the real excitement of the commission didn't happen until many years later. What was the Swiss role? Because, I mean, one, one does wonder, doesn't it, where you've got Switzerland there with these big mountains and the Swiss kind Sorry, of... Look, I, I couldn't hear that. The, the Swiss uh, kind of looking down uh, on Europe and seeing the First World War raging, the Second World War raging around them. Uh, I mean, one can be a bit cynical and say, well, they've made a lot of money out of both wars. Well, of course, it was, the neutral countries are obviously attractive during wartime for other countries to try and launder their money through, and Switzerland was no exception. And Switzerland, of course, has a long tradition of banking and of banking secrecy. But other countries were um, involved in two, I mean, Spain and Portugal and Sweden. And so it was all ways of Germany in particular trying to, uh, to use other people's gold in order to pay for raw materials and because there were blockades and there were, um, the Allies had measures in place to stop the Germans from moving around money freely, then clearly the Germans tried to use neutral countries in order to do that, and the Allies tried to stop them. Finally, what picture can you paint of Morton and Churchill? Because one of the uh, claims that Morton made was that he moved uh, down to Crockham Hill, just ne- close to Churchill's home, before Churchill bought Chartwell. Uh, well, and so he was implying that, in a way, was, that it Churchill... Was saying, uh, 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 roughly the same. It was roughly around the same time. I think they must have both been looking in the area... And in fact, you're, you're quite right, Morton actually paid up for his, his house uh, before Churchill actually moved in. But of course, the purchase of Chart 12 did take some time. So I, I don't know the detail, but I can presume that uh, Ch- uh, Morton, I always presume that Morton looked in that area because he knew that Churchill was looking in that area too. That was Jill Bennett there, and she's the author of Churchill's Man of Mystery. Desmond Morton and the World of Intelligence, um, a very interesting figure uh, at the end uh, and actually in the run-up to the Second World War, who definitely was one of those people that tried everything they could to stay in the shadows. Churchill's Man of Mystery, Desmond Morton and the World of Intelligence is a book by Jill Bennett, uh, published by Routledge um, in 2009. And in case anyone's interested in the idea of Churchill and the Freemasons, the Daily Mail article published on the 2nd of May 2008 is entitled Winston Churchill's Freemasons Writing Case Will Be Sold at Auction. And it does actually name uh, Winston Churchill's Masonic Lodge. Uh, The tan exterior is stamped in gilt with the words Brother Winston L. S. Churchill, Studholm Lodge, number 1591. BCFM is the community radio station for Bristol and is here to give everybody in Bristol a voice. 